morning. My talk today is on the hottest topic which everybody is in everybody's mouth. That is artificial intelligence. In my view, it is the emerging face of the scientific and industrial revolution. As you can see, the industrial revolution as we counted it started in around 1784 and moved towards several phases. We are in the phase of industry 4.0 and moving towards 5.0 where integration of artificial intelligence, cyber physical systems, Internet of Things, networks, and the most important thing is how knowledge discovery and other things are getting added. Before we go into the understanding of artificial intelligence, let us try and see what is the scientific and technological landscape. All scientific and technological discoveries go through these six phases. The first is about observations and experiments, whether you talk of Tycho Brahe or anybody else. Then comes no knowledge to new knowledge. Suddenly new knowledge is discovered which was not known before. Electricity, computing and so on and so forth. Then there is theory building. That means that new discovery is converted to an understanding through theory. From theory we go into technology, engineering and applications. And then finally we move to deployment at scale. The, like things which are at economic value, at technological value, at social value and available with everybody. For example, one was the printing press. Today we have the mobile phone. In between all this is incremental improvements and these incremental improvements are a key to the sudden new discoveries. All sudden new discoveries, all sudden technologies, including Newton's laws and everything else, has a long history of incremental improvements. Nothing happens all of a sudden except for very, very few things. The knowledge levels are public knowledge, intellectual property, trade secret, but the most important knowledge is know-how. How much is this knowledge available to the ordinary citizens at hand? And how much is it usable, effectively available? To look at this building of this knowledge landscape or map, the human beings evolved various kinds of knowledge modules, mathematics, the natural sciences, which evolved to physical, chemical, biological, then moved into engineering, then economics, earth, social, and then came the combination of computing and electronics and electrical devices. And with that, we moved into artificial intelligence and cyber physical systems, which has become the main aspect of scientific discovery, a biggest tool in addition to the human brain the biggest tool available to people today. From whether we want to make observations or experiments, whether we want to discover new knowledge, whether we want to understand it from the point of view of theory, whether we want to convert it to engineering or whether we want to look at it for deployment at scale. Today, artificial intelligence and its use with electronics and cyber physical embedded systems has become the biggest tool, the biggest microscope, the biggest simulator, the biggest analyzer and the biggest helping hand to the scientist. With computing, all sciences became transformed. The physical sciences where we had material sciences, process engineering, molecular modeling, all became computational molecular sciences, computational mechanical sciences. 
The whole of life sciences has transformed to a new field of computational biology. The whole of decision sciences has come up and human centric systems and newer and newer inv inventions came at the intersections. While it is interesting that computing in its formal method as we know today started in the 40s, though there is a longer history of all civilizations having done some computation of the other, the question Alan M. Turing asked around the same time when computing, he's the modern father of computing, he asked the same question at the same time is can computers think? And that started the field of artificial intelligence. Where we have the Turing test which says that the computer would deserve to be called intelligent if it could deceive a human into believing that it was human. Now with bots, with uh, uh, robots, talking robots, interaction robots and several other things, we are now fairly confused as to whether we have or have not achieved this level of Turing test. The roots of AI were at automated problem solving. Instead of writing computer programs for individual problems like chess playing or Google map finding or VLSI chip design or timetable scheduling, could we take a problem statement as input and use all the available knowledge that is available to the scientific community today? And could I have a solution automatically generated? So instead of writing individual programs, we wanted automated solutions when the problem statement is the input, as if I'm giving you a question paper of IIT JE and the computer will answer it. I'm giving you a new PhD problem statement, somebody will try to find a solution. This looked amazingly difficult. This looked impossible in, in those times, except for a few people who believed that in time this will be possible. Today, what have we achieved? The picture, the first picture on the top left, as you can see, is Gary Kasparov when he first lost to the computer. Today, computers are the best chess players in the world. Then we have these chatbots where you already have from Alexa to whosoever, you have robo citizens, you have digital twins where an aircraft flying from Delhi to San Francisco, the whole aircraft, everything that is happening in the aircraft engine is simulated digitally and available. And any error, any signal which is not, which is out of the world, if there is any failure, the automated failure detection happens on the fly and either it is self-corrected or by the time you reach, you have a replacement. Then you have the Mars rover, where so far away, where it takes several minutes for one communication to reach, this rover moves around and produce data for on and on and on. Then you have surgery. So I've picked up these six examples where this sort of precise surgery is going to become possible by computers, which no human being can do. How was this possible? This was possible because of three things. Compute became free. The computation that you can do on your mobile phone, even 20 years ago, you could not do on a supercomputer. Storage became free because the amount of garbage that we store in the memory, trillions and trillions of terabytes, petabytes of storage. Communication has also almost become free where we can communicate with each other. Our final frontier is power. Once we break through the power paradigm, then we will see how AI will really surge ahead. Let me give you for all you material science people. The first AI generated textbook was on lithium ion batteries. It is a machine generated summary of current research it is a very, very well written document. 
you can go and have a look at this paper. This paper actually is a computer written paper which read through all the papers, made a summary on lithium ion batteries and automatically the amount of material that is there shows us that this is not something which is just a scrappy set of uh, sentences copied pasted here and there. Well written, well structured, well documented, well researched. And I would request all of you to go and have a look at it. The next one. This was a paper published in again in 2019 where they looked at all papers on thermoelectric materials up to a certain year, let us say 2009. And they looked at all papers and the computer read all papers and used an algorithm called word to vec which converts words to vectors. The algorithm did not know a single bit about material science. It just used a vector representation. And based on that, it predicted many other possibilities of materials. So having read papers up to 2009, it predicted the next few best ones. And the, on the top one that it had predicted, that was discovered by the human being in 2012. So you can imagine how much is the, from 2009, so three years later human beings did what a computer of today could predict from 2009. What is this artificial intelligence? The artificial intelligence has got three parts. It is a formal set of tools, methods and methodologies that have modeling. That means they take a real world problem or a general description, convert it to an internal formal model, then use this formal model to do inference, deduction, prediction or whatever. And they also have a mechanism for learning from past not only from data, but also from their past own attempts to solve problems and input that back to the improved model and improved methods. So this cyclical loop of modeling, inference and learning where everybody interacts with everybody is at the core of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence has three paradigms. The first is the symbolic paradigm like we solve symbolic integration, like we write algebra, like we do analysis, like we develop graphs and so on and so forth. The second is statistical. When there is a large amount of data, how can you observe, use all the statistical theory and more to combine with your symbolic information? And the third is the neural paradigm and this neural paradigm creates a new direction by using the concept of neural networks and makes things called artificial neural networks to start doing prediction which is beyond statistics or symbolic. And these three work hand in hand. The objective is to try and combine the left brain and the right brain ideas into a single paradigm. All these did not come up in one shot. AI is an evolving science and technology and it has gone several ups and downs. The public may assume today is high point in AI. Yesterday was low point, day before yesterday was high point. But for us scientists who have been working on it for the last four decades, for us we see how incrementally we are moving ahead step by step. Three terms are important. One is artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is a general purpose method that I said. Then comes machine learning. Machine learning is all about using statistical methods and data driven methods. And deep learning is about using neural networks on data. So machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence and deep learning is a subset of machine learning. There are many other many areas, sub areas and sub fields like any other field. 
and I shall very quickly take you through some of these subjects. The first is about state spaces. Complex problem solving like Google Map or finding the solution to a problem is about modeling a problem in terms of states and configurations. And while I don't have a chance to go into the details, whether it is a robot arm or a robot manipulator or a control plant or a Google map finding, whether it is a single player or multiple players, whether it has got deterministic moves or probabilistic moves, all of this are embedded in the most powerful and the fundamental and the earliest form of AI, which is symbolic AI and is known as search. The second paradigm is logic. There is a fundamental mechanism by which, for example, if you give a problem wherever Mary goes, so does the lamb. Mary goes to school, so does the so the lamb goes to school or no contractors are dependable. Some engineers are contractors and therefore some engineers are not dependable. How would you deduce and derive them forward? So there is a paradigm called predicate logic, which is as powerful as computing. So whatever can be done by computing can be done by predicate logic and by logical deduction you can achieve. We have done a lot of interesting work in logical deduction in automotives where we predict and we analyze the whole automotive. You know, if the car breaks, should will the car stop the way the car has been designed? If the car breaks, will the car stop in two minutes? If there is an accident, will the uh, uh, you know uh, the the brake uh, the steering collapse? Will uh, the bags uh, blow? All these which are part of design. And let me tell you. Today, whether it is a chip or whether it is a car, all of them are initially designed in software. And this software is verified by such logical statements. Then the people who do all the work in material science, shapes and other things, constraint satisfaction is another area. I'm not going into details of the area, just giving you the terms because they will all be used later on. Then in your work, you'll have a lot of uncertainty. Uh, Dr. Shivan Kumari Mishra shared some of the CGCRI requirements and there was a lot of need for modeling uncertainty, modeling probabilistic behavior. And there is a whole theory, both of belief networks, fuzzy theory and neurofuzzy theory on this area. Natural language has been the holy grail. If anybody can understand natural language and solve problems by understanding natural language and return the answer in natural language, then it is definitely intelligent. And this level of intelligence of a human being is observed right from their earliest childhood. Natural language processing is different from computer language processing because it has got ambiguity, it has got phonetics, it has got uh, the mechanism by which you say it, then all your mannerisms by which you say it, the context in which you say it. So natural language processing has been one of the most important fields of artificial intelligence. Then we come to machine learning. Machine learning means that the machine will learn from data, and that data could be examples, could be data, could be pictures, could be video, or could be processes, could be observing a human being or whatever. Learning is of three types. Supervised, in which you have got a teacher and um, solution. That means your data has got correct and incorrect labels. The second is unsupervised learning, in which you only have data but nobody has provided you with the labeling of that data. What is what? And the third is reinforcement learning where you learn by acting. And there is another new form of machine learning that has come up, which is called self supervised learning, which is like thinking. 
self introspection. And there are several schemes which have been developed scientifically to evolve each of these. Artificial neural networks is at the heart of modern day computing and AI and prediction, classification and things like that. They are a copy and an attempt to understand how the brain works. And here are four classifications, including feed forward networks, which are used for prediction, hop field networks, which are used to model content memory. The memory that we have in our computers is different from the memory that we have in our brain. If I give you half of a picture, you will predict the rest of the picture. So it is content accessed. So these networks are also content accessed and they work with a very interesting theory of uh, optimization. Then you have a combination of feed forward and hop field networks which give recurrent and winner take all networks which are useful for many things like modeling retina, like modeling speech, like modeling our famous autocomplete and things like that. The latest in artificial neural networks is deep learning. Deep learning is almost one shot. That means previously machine learning would extract features and then pass it on to the network. Deep learning does not require you to learn even features. You just give examples and it will tell you the output. This works like magic, but there is a very interesting underlying theory behind it. Among the deep learning networks, the convolution deep learning network, which will be very useful for all experimentalists, where image or videos are taken as input and it is classified. So all your work on characterization, which will use, be very happy to use convolution neural networks, and it has been used for many things from X-ray detection to COVID detection, to not only just de detecting whether it's a car or a bus, but in medical diagnostics, it has become one of the most important areas. And it has also become, as I shall show you later on, in material science characterization from images, convolution deep neural networks has become state of the art. With the focus on attention on convolution neural networks, it is able to predict things that is not uh, you know, even a human expert can often not find. It, like, it has got great potential in your domain. The other interesting thing is called long short term memory. This is a very interesting network where a deep neural network where people are able to use temporal data. That means time you have longitudinal data, data of an experiment over time, you have time series data and things like that, and you want to learn both short term and long term frequencies, short term patterns and long term patterns. So these are very useful for understanding continuous experiments. They have been used for language understanding, word understanding. The everybody who sees this autocomplete on your computer, uh, on your handheld or mobile phone, you will know that this is based on this LSTM theory and mechanism. Finally, all this is represented into knowledge. Modern day knowledge is represented as what are called knowledge graphs. And here I have shown you how looking at DBpedia, people are able to extract knowledge and create knowledge graphs for metallic materials, and they can be enriched by more details and you can go deeper and deeper down. Publicly available tools are available and it is another framework for scientists, especially in this materials area, to develop a powerful knowledge base of your materials. AI ML have been transforming domains, modeling, prediction, diagnostics, monitoring, decision making, Transforming heterogeneous data, you have data, you have images, you have uh, material from text, and how do you want to combine all of them? Like I showed you word to vet, I will show you another example in your domain. 
So modeling complex nonlinear processes. Discover description, prediction, prevention, prescription, automated learning, optimization and many other things. Let me try try to bring coal to Newcastle or coal to Jharia or coal to Dhanbad by trying to tell you a little bit about AIML for material science engineering. Most of you will know about it. So I have picked up five topics and sh will show you five examples. The first is science driven simulation. Most of your simulation, atomistic simulation or any of your CFD simulation or any of these simulations which uses millions of variables takes hours and hours to run. But if they are trained through neural networks and today the new technology is to augment it with physics or chemistry, then the simulations can work wonders. The second is about prediction of property that is mapping structure property relationships. Then is the synthetic route for tailored materials. Then is experimental parameter optimization. And finally is improved characterization and understanding. Like work to vec, atoms to vec is a very recent work where they have looked at the whole of a database of atoms and all the molecules that these atoms are associated with. So as you can see here, the atoms and the environment, they list a one if there is an environment associated with this atom or not. And from that they create a vector for each atom. This method is oblivious. This method will do it for words. This method will do it for anything else. But using these atoms and converting it to atom vectors and then using clustering on the right hand side, they produced a table of the clusters and this table uncannily is similar to the periodic table, which means that this method has automatically learned how to generate periodic table from just looking at materials and their combinations. So you can imagine how powerful this is. This was published in PNAS recently. Your conv conventional DFT approach to classifying electrolytes would require your understanding of the atomistic structure, looking at all your microscopic structures, then setting up your equations and physical parameters and then detect. It will take four weeks. On the other hand, if you look at all the past known structures, look at the known conductivities and pass it on to a combination of neural networks, random forests and support vector machines. This one gave 90% accuracy. So you really get very, very high accuracy, very, very fast in less than one second. So that's what I said, speeding up your simulation, doing whatever you could do in bioinformatics, like, you know, you have got uh, bioinformatics where you, before you do the wet experiment, you run it on the computer and, and do the analysis. The same work which appeared in ChemMatter, there again they used this sort of machine learning to discover solid lithium ion conducting materials. I picked up these examples because I thought that these are examples which are of interest to CGCRI in particular. And if you go through this work, you will see that this work, they were almost 97% correct in terms of the prediction of the materials to be selected. Organic synthesis. This is another very recent work where the Schneider et al proposed a new chemical reaction fingerprint. The one with white, red, green, that is a fingerprint structure that they obtained. And then they combined a plethora of AI tools from random forest, naive base, k-means and logistic regression methods to predict. They first went and developed a 50 class ML model, a machine learned model. 
and then they started pre predicting the organic synthesis and to your surprise not to ours but at least to most of the people there this is another recent work where they had got 97 percent accuracy following the similar lines in nature in 2018 they used ai they used neural networks as well as monte carlo simulation and significantly found out what are they took a target molecule they expanded the molecule for its possibilities then they ran it through a neural network then they funneled it through then they ran simulations of experiments of those uh, shortlisted items and then used those reactions and shortlisted the predictions and the results came out excellent these are very very interesting issues and i would suggest that cgcri explodes all this for them for their work in process optimization here is a uh, uh, you know this is a uh, aerosol uh, jet printing process where the optimizer how much to spray what to do all this was machine learned by running the experiments in many ways simulating these experiment as well as getting actual experimental data and from that the machine learned mechanism could really find out exactly the operating points finally as i said in automated defect classification you all your images through electron microscopes all of this can be taken and worked out in great details and these through the latest attention networks while studying this i was getting several good ideas about how people have already used this sort of technology in medical diagnostics and there is i believe a huge scope for doing characterization using ai and i would leave it to you all of you to really work on it in in more details coming to other areas when you come to machining or manufacturing the monitoring of the cutting tool the real time optimization of the roughness health monitoring of a machine control of the robot when you come to welding and we have much of it here about how to track exactly this welding when we went to big companies like lnt or some of these uh, our own drdo uh, manufacturing units where welding large scale welding is required how to check whether the welding is happening correctly how to control the robotic welding arm and how to identify defects how to ensure that the welding is perfect all of this has got ai integration possibilities and huge scope for improvement additive manufacturing here from the whole 3d optimization to the control of the printing to the defect analysis all of this can be done in real time now machines are everywhere today we know that we have a pacemaker an artificial heart we have an artificial leg soon we are going to have an artificial kidney and except for the artificial brain i believe that you know machines will be everywhere and there is a joke that goes on which says that in the future when there is a problem with your kidney uh, you will uh, go to a doctor and say uh, the doctor will say wait and after some time the doctor will do something with you just sitting out there and then say it is done and you will feel better so doctor will uh, then you will ask the doctor you didn't even touch me how did you repair my kidney so the doctor will say i downloaded a patch the software was defective so that is what we are in for whether it is control of atomic reactors or control of automobiles we already know of self driving cars so that leads us to the combination of ai with physical systems and that leads us to the industrial internet of things which again i think is the focus point of ccri and ai the whole use of ai for cyber physical systems for which there are at least 
20 or 30 centers having been developed, including one at IIT Kharagpur uh, for doing that. Just to give you a sample, for all the sensors that are there in an agricultural field, this data, whether it's a tractor, whether it's a soil sensor, temperature sensor, or an actuator like a sprinkler, or, or something which uh, does covering of a shed, etc. All these controls are going to come up to a decision support system, and that goes into a cloud, and there is a backend cloud where all these machine learning algorithms work. The edge layer requires real-time uh, AI, and the physical layer is controlled. Today, people are willing, there are some companies who sell tractors who are willing to sell you the tractor for free, provided you give them the data. So the data is the knowledge by which they will improve the designs of many other tractors. So, you know, we now have a lot of courses coming up in our AI center where we talk about AI for cyber physical systems. This is another unique area which I think will also be important for CGCRI and the larger community. Similarly, you know, there are these autonomous robots which are all self-driven, autonomous packaging. All of them have these AI algorithms inbuilt into it. So tomorrow's factory with digital twins that I showed, just showed you. And in addition to that, you are going to have these augmented reality, extended reality, and things like that. But AI has moved into a newer dimension. We talked about how AI can assist a human being, how AI can be integrated to a human being. The third dimension, which is the goal where we are moving into these autonomous systems, is the system behaves like a human being. There is no human being, but AI behaves like a human being or even better. So there are several things that human beings can do very easily, which still computers cannot do. Speech recognition, computer vision, though there has been improvements, but still even a little child understands it. The computer today requires huge amount of data to learn. A little child will learn it from minimal data. But we still have language recognition, speech recognition, voice recognition, and several other tools already developed. The most interesting tool developed were human analysis in terms of facial recognition, micro expressions. You know, today when we are walking, you don't recognize anybody because everybody's face is covered. How do you recognize somebody? You recognize them by their walking style you recognize them exactly by the way they are walking. From that you will make out that this person. I have been trying to observe this and from that new ideas on AI come up. So there is this whole of behavior metrics, which is another frontier of AI today. In order to now try and model the computer brain, the human brain is the holy grail. Can we model the human brain? So there is a project which I don't want to go into details because of the time that is given to me is the computational brain. And that is making great strides in terms of modeling a general purpose AI, not specific AI for uh, uh, language understanding, vision understanding, etc., but a general purpose AI. Then AI with the brain computer interfaces today eye tracking today, uh, you know, EEG, ECG, but the latest technologies that are coming up is people are able to try and communicate with the brain through signals, try and understand the signals of the brain. And there is a lot of theory which needs to still be predicted that the human brain produces signals which we still do not understand, which still do not capture. We consider them to be noise, but those are signals. There has been work done which took in a lot of skin resistance signals, and people would just get a single skin resistance value. But when they looked, analyzed the full signal, which was considered noise, 
they found that there is early detection. So signals which emanate from the human being are, are an extremely important aspect. So what do we do with all this? What is our goal? Our goal is to make human life better, life on the planet better. So the thing about AI is that it covers all disciplines. It transcends across all disciplines. So target convergence. AI, which is digital convergence, can be used in transportation, healthcare, manufacturing, infrastructure, and for all of this, you will see you require materials. And that forms the heart, and I would recommend that a convergence, an AI convergence for material science can become an important agenda for CGCI. The other area is social convergence, food sustainability, life science. And I will give you an example that if you look at the agricultural food chain, then this whole sustainability cycle, everywhere AI can be used. And that I think is a, another important framework. We've done some very interesting work in this area, but uh, I can go into that when we have an opportunity in more details. We think that we cannot support the environment. AI, is one of the key tools for us to protect our environment, to obtain data, to get a deeper understanding of how archaeological structures happen. I was in the Jagannath, Sri Jagannath Temple Puri. I was observing how we can gather so much of data to understand this structure. Language, literature. There is a very interesting work on music that is being carried out at IIT Kharagpur on understanding of Indian raga music using AI. And Indian raga music, as you know, does not fall under the standard grammar. So can AI be understood? How can we understand yoga? How can we understand alternative medicine? How can we understand alternative materials and structures and built forms? How can we understand tea, coffee, hand loom? And there is, I have this whole dream of how we can use AI for all of this. And I will request that if you have some ideas and thoughts and interests, we can pursue it further. Is creativity beyond AI? Can we replicate a Satyajit Ray or an Alal or, or uh, Pandit Ravi Shankar or Ali Akbar or Ram King Karbej or Ravindranath Tagore? People will think it is impossible. AI always worked through times when people said everything was impossible. But here is already what is in. Sony has produced music that is almost indiscernible from what Bach, from experts say this is exactly as all the features of Bach. Then there is a painting called the new next Rembrandt, which was produced by AI and 3D printing. Nobody is able to find out a flaw saying that this is not a Rembrandt feature. Every feature of Rembrandt, and this is not an old painting. This is a completely new painting. Including the painting is done by 3D. So on the canvas, you will, your finger will, uh, you know, move. People have been able to take mice and use, plug something, drill something into their brains and use a neural network and control that mouse. People have been able to put in chips into the retina where certain kinds of blind people can see. So there is nothing impossible for AI. And because there is nothing impossible for AI, AI can do things that you don't want it to do. So AI is a double-edged sword. It can see everything, it can watch everything, and it can intrude on your privacy. Moreover, the AI algorithms are not God. There is a full area of AI, which is called adversarial AI, where you can show that I will take a picture. I will make small differences in the picture. Human will see it to be a cat. The AI will tell it to become a pig or an aeroplane or something else. And therefore, AI is open to adversarial attacks. 
And because AI is a black box, non-explanational thing in some aspects of deep learning, not all aspects. So the whole idea of AI is to now make AI robust, AI responsible, and AI safe, where explanation, interpretation, theory, all of that need to come into AI. AI has another aspect. AI has social legal implications. Not only privacy and security. If AI is running the car and you are sitting in the driver's wheel and AI is controlling how the car will move, if the car makes an accident, who is responsible? If AI makes an invention, then is the patent going to be given to AI? Who owns the technology? Should we worry about AI? AI has bias. If it may have a lot of data, and uh, you know, if it has data of one side, there is a lot of uh, things to show that AI today has, um, you know, because of the limited amount of uh, data, it it uh, you know targets women. It thinks because most of the data is about male members, therefore it becomes biased towards male. AI can become a weapon liability, jobs. So should we worry about AI? We should. And therefore it is the work of the scientific community to develop safe and responsible AI. Points to ponder. Whose problems are we solving with AI? Are we trying to use AI to make the air conditioner of a rich man's house more and more bet better and better so that his or her power is reduced, comfort is increased. Or are we going to reduce arsenic? Are we going to remove poverty? Are we going to remove uh, education disparity? So the same technology that can be used for you to de uh, decide whether you, what sort of mobile phone you will buy, how to detect which is the best mobile phone to buy, can be the same thing that the same technology of recommendation systems can be used to decide what should this person learn online. So these are the most important things that we need to ponder about. Whose problems are we solving? Today's work is about integration and sustainability. So are we using AI to build sustainable materials, sustainable technologies that will target the fishermen? that will target the school children, that will target those who really would change their whole lifestyle if we give them a little bit of AI and cyber physical systems. So whenever we were young and uh, Dr. Suman Kumari will remember when we used to go to Kharagpur station, this notice of Gandhiji used to be there. Whenever you are in doubt, when the self becomes too much, apply the following test. Recall the face of the poorest and weakest man whom you may have seen and ask yourself if the step you contemplate is going to be any use for you. Same with AI. So while we build the latest technologies, make ourselves the most powerful, while CGCRI starts embarking on an AI mission to work on everything from characterization to process modification, there is a whole paper on what are the challenges of AI for glass technologies, which I was reading. I don't understand all of it, but uh, y'all can have a look at it. And we will be very happy to work with all of you. But in, in addition to all that, keeping the theme of today's lecture, we need harmonious AI. For this nation, I would request CGCRI to come up with a sustainable AI program that can help this country and the world. Thank you very much.